Welcome to the Disability Channel. My name is Jay Stoy, and we're here at Queen's Park inside the suite of the Lieutenant Governor, Elizabeth Dowdswell. Lieutenant Governor, thank you so much for being on the show today. You're very welcome. Wow. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate this. Not at all. This is, this is really exciting for our community, our platform, and Ontario in general. What I'd like to do today is we're going to get in-depth with the Lieutenant Governor's day-to-day -day, uh, roles, what you do. So maybe you can just start by saying... Um, tell me your experience with receiving the call to receive the job. How was that? How was that? <laughs> it was a big surprise. It certainly wasn't on my radar screen at all. Fortunately, I knew something about the position only because I worked in, uh, in and around government for a long time and uh, internationally as well. So I was well familiar with the Commonwealth and, uh, and what vice regals actually do. Uh, but uh, never anticipated that I'd be on the receiving end of the phone call. And I understand this is your fifth year now in office. I know. I can't believe how quickly it's gone by. The days are very full. I, I sometimes laugh when people say to me, do you actually go into the office? I'm saying every day. Uh, it is a 24-7 job. I think some people think it's uh, one just does uh, commemorative and celebratory uh, events and especially in the evenings, but uh, my day starts uh, at the latest by eight in the morning. And uh, a couple of times this week, it's been more like six because I've been wow. traveling. Well, I and know we go till the late, late evening as well. Just to pick up on that, I know talking about uh, your heavy workload, 150 stories, I know you are integral in making this book happen. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your, your part in the book. Well, it's a wonderful story. And if I can just backtrack for one moment, you know, people understand that the role of a lieutenant governor is a constitutional role. So you'll see me uh, uh, signing off on most documents that the, uh, the government passes, um, bills, uh, it, uh, it seeks royal assent on legislation, and you'll see me delivering uh, their speech from the throne and, and things like that. And then we do a lot of celebratory events, uh, honoring good citizenship around the province, uh, paying tribute to those first responders who have uh, served us so well and may have died, yes. all kinds of community events. But the thing that really intrigues me about the position is how one can use this platform to really shine a light on issues that are important to Ontarians. And I decided that uh, I needed to understand who Ontarians were. So one of the projects that we undertook under uh, Canada 150 uh, was to invite 150 Ontarians to tell me in just 150 words, like an extended tweet, <laughs> what it meant to be an Ontarian in Canada or vice versa. And so 150 stories was born and it represents stories from uh, people you would know whose yes. names you would recognize, but also the person I met on the street in Thunder Bay and so forth. And they're uh, very readable, uh, and they really resonated with people because Ontarians could see themselves in the stories. And so um, there were two themes that were so predominant. One was the theme of uh, the immigration of, uh, of people. Most people uh, wrote about where they came from okay. and uh, what brought them to Canada and how they're now giving back. Very nice. And the other one was about place matters. And that's a cultural place and a physical place. So lots of stories about the Great Lakes and Georgian Bay and, uh, and how that shaped people's memories uh, of their lives, how it shaped their family interactions. And uh, so, and, and cultural spaces as well. And in fact, there are a couple of very interesting stories uh, from people in the, I call it, ability community. <laughs> uh, certainly my predecessor, David Onley, yes. who would be well known to your viewers, uh, was instrumental. And his, his shaping of the whole notion of talking about abilities, not just disabilities, uh, was fundamental to my understanding. And then I met a young woman, uh, Nan Zim, who's just the most remarkable entrepreneur, photographer, 
and uh, her story is in here as well. So it's uh, a great collection. It's a great collection. We've had people knocking on the door saying, I just want one of those books, please. Well, it's great because if I, if, I, if I can remember correctly, it was offered in the package of the Evictus Games. Oh, yes. Right? So because we cover the Evictus Games ourselves, and what a, what a great uh, time for, uh, for Toronto, Canada, and the world. And I remember opening up the, uh, I guess, the, the package they gave you, and I remember the book was inside there. So That's great right. exposure. Well, you know, we believe that, um, that things like the arts and culture and sport are such powerful tools for bringing people together, for creating communities and understanding. I mean, I, I remember watching uh, one of the, um, I think it was at the Paralympics, uh, and I think it was the, um, um, hmm, was one of the, um, the, the really rough, Games. Okay. Might have been soccer. Might have been soccer. Okay. And okay. Uh, I can remember seeing whole families. The place was just full of families. And I thought, what a remarkable way to show what people are capable of at a very young age. So true. It was such an educational experience. But this is great. But such joy. And of course, when Invictus was here, that was marvelous. Uh, my favorite moment of the Invictus games, aside from, of course, uh, being with Prince Harry, mm -hmm. which is everybody's favorite. Yes, moment, yes. Is it not? He wouldn't let us interview him, but I did meet him. But he uh, said, no, we can't. We're just going to have time, Jay. I went, That's okay. <laughs> but uh, I spent uh, breakfast on the last Saturday morning with the families of the Canadian athletes. Oh, wow. And that was just so remarkable. It was such a great event. And I just want to say, um, we're here with Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell. I want to say thank you for having us today. We're not finished. I just want to say thank you. And I also want to add in that Mr. Only was so instrumental. About five, six, seven years ago, he had us into our the same office here, gave us his time, was very kind to us. I, I do want to thank David. Thank you, Mr. Only, for the time. Can we get a little bit into your day-to-day -day aspects, what you do as your role? I'm sure our viewers would love to know what you do from day to day. Well, every day is quite different, but they're all full. We do about um, over 770 events in a year. Wow. And some of those are one-on-one -on -one meetings. Some of them are big events. Some of them are award ceremonies. Some of them are days, uh, I've had several in the last week, where I've been out visiting communities. I asked to see the mayor okay. in a municipality. Um and uh, sit down with his council, ask him to bring together uh, people in the community and uh, essentially talk to them about what they're proud of. Uh, what should I know about uh, Windsor or London or Thunder Bay or any place else in the province? And uh, what, what, what are they proud of? Um, and, uh, and of course, what they're challenged by. And it gives me a sense of, uh, of what Ontarians are going through uh, and who they really are as people. That's wonderful. In the summertime as well, we um, carry on uh, an initiative that was started by my predecessors uh, to uh, visit uh, Aboriginal nations, oh, okay. Indigenous nations in the north, uh, fly in to some of the summer literacy camps for children. And uh, those are always... You come away with mixed emotions. Yes. Uh, you see uh, the challenges that people have, but you also see the eternal hope and optimism as well. And uh, and that's a wonderful kind of thing to do. So I'm just looking at, like, obviously, your, your, your history, your, your experience, your resume, your work experience. Um, tell us how, because we noticed that you're really savvy when it comes to the business world. And you're also very experienced when it comes to education and youth. So tell us in your role here, how do you combine the two, if that, if you can? Like how you combine your, your business savvy with giving opportunities to today's youth? Well, my, uh, my experience has been a very eclectic one. I've, I've followed my curiosity, I guess. And uh, that, that has been a great gift. I've changed careers every four years or so working uh, from Saskatchewan, across Canada, then internationally. 
And uh, one of the things that, uh, and, and in a lot of different sectors as well. Well, the UN too, right? Uh, yes, yeah, I yep. was Under Secretary General of the UN wow. for a number of years. That must have been quite the experience. It was. You know what was wonderful about it was you get to see many other countries and see what they are challenged by, uh, but you also get to see your own country through a different lens. Okay. And it's one of the things I often say to young people, we are so prosperous in this country, in this province. Uh, we have uh, wonderful geography and natural resources, of course, mm -hmm. that are the envy of the world. Yes. We have intellectual resources, an education system, bar none. Uh, we have relatively stable systems of governance. And uh, we have things that much of the rest of the world does not have. So it's, uh, it is, we shouldn't take it for granted. And yet, um, we also have to be vigilant because there are so many changes going on in the world. Environmental change, technological change. Yes, yes, especially. Ge geopolitical Whoa. shifts. Yeah. And I think people are genuinely thinking about how are we going to be resilient into the future? So is my child going to have dignified work in the future? Are we going to be able to continue to afford to live in the kind of housing that we have now? Uh, how are we going to prepare for that change that is going to be inevitable? Very it's important. Not going to go yeah. away. Very important talking and points. And so, yeah. just because of the, the, I've been so fortunate to experience so many other parts of the world and so many other sectors. Um, there are always lessons to be learned from one to the other, and always stories to be told. This is great. Well, I, I thank you for your time today, Lieutenant Governor. Again, You're very appreciative. Welcome. What we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back with a little, a little surprise for you, if that's okay. That's great. Positive Thank surprise, you. positive <laughs> surprise. So stay tuned and we'll be back with the Disability Channel. We're here in Queens Park, uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor's suite. We'll be back in two minutes. Welcome back to the Disability Channel. We're here at Queen's Park. We're here with Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell. We have a little special gift for you today, the uh, Governor, courtesy of uh, Casey McKay. Hi, Casey. Welcome. So Casey is one of our editors. He is in our employment program, which we would love to tell you more about at another time. We have an employment program, which is called Digital Ventures, where we train people in the digital world, like Casey. Casey is one of our editors, and he has edited something very special with regards to 150 stories. So ah. we can just push click and just uh, give you a little gift. Wonderful. Here we go. Bobby Orr, Hockey Hall of Famer, Stanley Cup winner, and a three-time league MVP was raised in Perry Sound, Ontario, Canada. Quite fortunate to have the upbringing that he had, Bobby was surrounded by a wonderful group of volunteers and mentors. The support he gained helped cultivate his love for hockey. It was a common occurrence for him and his friends to head out to the bay once it had frozen over. In the summer months, the kids could be found playing road hockey until the sunset. Through these countless hours spent developing his passion for the game, he honed his skills. He's widely noticed as one of the greats of his time.
Bobby Orr retired from his esteemed career in 1978. so much. It's wonderful to see our words come to life. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're very excited with the work that uh, our team does. We're, we're super excited with the book. So we just thought when we, when we had the book, we thought we have to really showcase this in, in, a, in, a, in a different way, you know, in a, an added way, just to make it blossom that much more. And maybe we can tell your viewers that uh, the book uh, can be uh, looked at on our website, the Lieutenant uh, Governor's website. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for your time today, Lieutenant Governor. We really appreciate this. Thank you. And uh, thank you for coming. we'll stay in touch. And again, we're here at the Queen's Park. We're here at the Lieutenant Governor's Suite with Elizabeth Dowdswell. I'm Jay Stoyan. You're watching the Disability Channel. We'll see you next time.